So we'll move to our next um, talk, which is the student presentation on two projects. So the first group will be the machine learning um, presentation. Will Chapman, who led the group, who did a lot of preparatory work before the summer school as well. So thanks, um, Will, and yeah, whenever you're ready. Sounds good. Uh, are you all seeing my screen now? Yeah, it's not full screen. Okay, perfect. Good. Wonderful. All right. Um, cool. So our group was looking at exploring machine learning for tercile two meter temperature S2S prediction. And we're particularly using the CSM lens for training data and testing. Um, so we had an excellent group, uh, Fernando, David, myself, Tim, Yakman, Wenwen, and a lot of guidance from Anish and Judith. Uh, so a little outline for what we'll talk about is really the what, why, and then we'll establish a baseline metric for comparison to our machine learning methods. We'll look at the data um, and specifically the machine learning methods. Then we'll transition to some of our model results and look at some explainable uh, artificial intelligence results and then point towards future work where we want to take this. Um, so really what we want to do is we want to test various statistical models for forecasting two meter temperature uh, skill at S2S lead times. Uh, statistical models are nice because they're fast, they're simple, they're easily interpretable. Um, and we want to see if we can establish some sort of theoretical ceiling for, for skill. So we look at a, a perfect prog prognostic model framework in which we're using the CSM lens and predicting the CSM lens. We do this because it is an extremely large uh, data set here, very, very long running. And particularly, we use the the Pi control member, which has a thousand years uh, worth of data. It doesn't have this nasty trend. Um, and again, we want to establish some sort of ceiling for how good these statistical models can do. Uh, and we want to see if we can really use some interpretable methods to identify forecast fund as well opportunities. So a lot of work here. Um, so first thing we want to do is establish a baseline method uh, to see if we can, these modern machine learning methods can compete with. Uh, so for that, we used the Johnson et al. 2014 forecast method, which is looking at skillful wintertime North American temperature forecasts out to four, out to four weeks. And they just use the state of ENZO, ENZO and the MJO. The way they do that, they establish some sort of climatological uh, PDF here uh, and define tercile bounds at the 33rd and 67th percentile for cold, neutral, and warm states. Then they look at the state of ENZO. They look at the state of MJO. They see how this probability uh, distribution shifts. And uh, whatever the shift in that distribution is, they, they grab the tercile that it most, uh, most often falls in. And they forecast that as their probability to say, okay, it's going to be hot if it shifted like this. And they evaluate their forecast with the Heidecke skill score, which we will be doing also. So Heidecke skill score is a really simple metric that has been introduced a couple times during this uh, uh, colloquium, but it's really saying how much better are we than a random guess. Um, a zero means that we're we're pretty much climatology. A 100 is a perfect forecast. A negative infinity is you're doing really really bad. So anything positive, we're better than climatology. Um, so to compare that with, we don't have a ton of times to go into these methods, uh, but I wanted to say we have two really really flexible statistical mo models that will be. Uh, testing out. And the first one is a, a random forest, specifically an independent gradient boosted classifier. Uh, the predictors for it, we feed it the same predictors as the, the Johnson et al. model. So we, we give the uh, Nino 3.4 index, the uh, RMN indices, and then we one hot encode the MJO phase, which means we're just letting it know that there's a categorical variable here. And we, we give it zero for when MJO is uh, off, and then uh, one through eight for the remaining phases. Uh, and then we're trying to predict this seven day average two meter temperature and we're, we're making a new model, we're constructing a new model at every lat long location uh, over land. Uh, so random forests, again, not super complicated, but it's, it's basically an ensemble uh, of decision trees that are then voting on a, a forecast and what is output is three nodes, the probability that it's uh, cold, the probability that it's a neutral state and the probability that it's a hot state. Uh, for the neural network, we're doing a very similar thing. Uh, we are outputting three probability states with the same predictor variables, looking at the probability of cold, probability of neutral, probability of hot, whatever this highest here, we guess that is our forecast. Uh, we wanna point out that we trained on 100 years of model data. Um, so from model years 400 to 500, 
And then we tested on model years 500 to 600. And we validated our models over here, but we tested here. Um, and so everything you'll see moving forward is on uh, just the testing data uh, to show that our model is generalizing. It's not just overfitting to our data, our training data. So looking at some results, uh, here is the three week forecast over North America. Uh, the stipling shows where the forecast is not statistically different from zero after controlling for false discovery. Um, so we can see pretty apparently that there are two uh, machine learning methods are more skillful over a larger domain, uh, particularly the neural network is uh, the most skillful metric. I want to point out that the color bar here is only going up to about 14. So this is not a, it's not a highly skillful forecast, but there is definitely forecast skill here. Um, if you average this over the entire spatial domain and you look across the weeks, uh, week one out to week six, uh, the neural network remains the, the most skillful forecast. There's a pretty stark drop off in skill in week five. Um, and the random forest sort of second place. And then this distributional Johnson method is sort of our lowest forecast skill. Uh, if we look at this spatially, uh, it tells a, a fairly nice story of, of fairly the same thing, but we're, we're seeing again that this neural net uh, forecast out to first four weeks at least is very, very skillful compared to the other two methods. Uh, and then we see sort of this skillful drop off. Um, I wanna point out this, this region in Northern Mexico here, because this will be important for some of our interpretable AI methods as we, we walk forward. Uh, we also wanted to state that we, we did look at other regions. We didn't just focus on North America. Uh, we had one group member that, that ran entire, this all of this data, which is terabytes worth of data uh, through all these uh, methods for South America too. And we see a very similar phenomenon here, uh, especially where you would imagine the, the strong ENSO connections are if we see really high. Uh, forecast skill. Um, something interesting that we observed is uh, our previous skill metrics that we, we showed were looking at the entire data set. But if you look at some uh, conditional uh, stratified forecasts, uh, particularly looking at when ENSO is off, but MJO is in a, a particularly active phase eight, we see a strong peaking of skill over certain regions in the model. And I want to point out that this Heidecke skill score is now going up to, to somewhere in the 30 to 40 range. Whereas before we were looking at 14. So there are definitely skillful windows of opportunity that we can look at here. Um, so with that being said, we wanted to sort of examine what the model was learning. Um, so transferring from just inputting indices, we decided to input full spatial maps of OLR and SST in the tropics. And we're going to use this method layerwise relevance propagation introduced by Barn or Libby Barnes in our in the talks throughout the week. Uh, that is sort of like the gold standard in interpretable AI right now, or explainable AI right now in our field. And essentially what it does is it takes the probability of the output, propagates it backwards, and it says, what were the relevant regions that gave me this skill or this forecast? Why did I forecast what I did? Um, so we'll show it for that highly skillful point in uh, Northern Mexico. And we're looking at the neutral state, the cold state, and the warm state. And what we did is we took the most likely, we took the, the highest confidence pro forecast. So anything where it forecasts over, I think, 80% that it was going to be in a neutral, a cold or warm state. And essentially, what we got back is what we expected because we sort of baked in the answer here. What we're seeing is ENSO. So in the cold state, this is the LRP over the right for the SST and for the OLR. So if the cold state, we have a nice uh, Nino condition along with really familiar OLR signature that would go along with this, uh, this strong El Nino. For the warm state, it looks to be a uh, La Nina in the SST temperatures, and then again, uh, depressed convection here, uh, according to this OLR map. Again, this is OLR composites, and this is SST composites, and the corresponding region that the, the network is looking. Um, so where do we want to go with this uh, for future work? We know that the forecast skill is good, but we don't actually know if these probabilities coming out of the model are, are particularly good. Are they reliable? Are they calibrated? There are some nice, nice methods introduced by Sure et al. 2020 that we can actually calibrate these uh, probabilistic predictions really well. So that way we have a little bit more confidence in what we're, we're doing. And then we want to conduct some transfer learning. Uh, so moving from CSM lens uh, and seeing if we can freeze some of this model develop the models developed on CSM lens, move those over to observations, train a little bit more and see if we can transfer some of this skill into uh, real life. See if we can uh, leverage CSM lens to improve our, our observation predictions. Um, oh, 
for conclusions, uh, so we used Heidecke skill score to assess this forecast. So random forest and neural nets were more uh, uh, skillful than the sort of baseline Johnson all method. Um, so forecast lead times from front one to four weeks, the neural net was particularly skillful, but the skill kind of dropped off after that. Uh, using the interpretable AI, um, we were able to make sure that the networks were actually learning the ENSO and these MJO teleconnections. And we we're highlighting these convective regions, known things. Um, so we're starting to push into ways to shut off ENSO in our prediction and then look at what uh, the network would then look at. And we've done some preliminary testing there, but we, we won't show that here uh, just because it we're still wrapping our brains around it. So these results highlight that the neural network's uh, model ability improved these S to S two meter predictions over the for, over the US, particularly in CSM lens. What this means for the uh, real observations uh, sort of remains to be seen. But with that, uh, thank you. Great, thanks, Will. Um, we'll move to the next group's presentation now and then come back to um, the questions. So our next group, yeah, Sam. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. screen. Yeah. Okay, does everyone see it? Yeah. Awesome. Um, so our group over the last uh, couple of weeks have focused uh, on S2S model verification of two meter temperature over the CONUS. And our group is uh, Jordan, Tyler, Sam, Sadiksha, and myself, Melanie. And our facilitators were uh, Abby J and Judith Werner. So, uh, I think over the past couple of weeks, we've all we've all seen that at the S2S uh, timescale, predictability is lower compared to typical weather forecasts or seasonal forecasts. And specifically due to, uh, or specifically for heat, we know that heat waves are becoming more frequent and intense. And we've also seen a lot of record breaking temperatures within the United States over the past couple of years, um, specifically like in the West Coast uh, a couple months ago or even maybe about a month ago. Um, so what are some of the sources of predictability over the North American continent? Uh, the one we'll focus on today is the PNA, Pacific North American pattern. Um, so this pattern in a positive phase uh, is associated with higher heights over the Western United States and lower heights over the Eastern United States and vice versa for a negative PNA pattern. Um, PNA teleconnections uh, do for temperature so when we're in a positive PNA pattern, we typically see warmer temperatures over a majority of Canada and along the West Coast and lower temperatures for uh, the Eastern Coast. Um, this is also the opposite within the negative PNA pattern. Um, but we also see that there's not much impact on temperature during the summer. So we also wanted to kind of split up by season to see what the difference is um, based off season. So to analyze data, we worked with the package uh, Climpred developed by Aaron Spring and Riley Brady. Uh, using Climpred, we calculated anomaly correlation coefficients for data sets, um, which is basically going to provide us a skill relative to climate, with positive one being a perfect correlation, zero indicating no correlation. So we worked with three sets of model output gathered from the subseasonal to seasonal prediction project, um, the European Center for a Medium Range Weather Forecast model, a model from INSEP, and then CESM version two, and we compared those to observational data from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. Um, our work focused on the two meter temperature averages. And so we looked at the skill of different models as compared to the observational data, and then also looked at the state dependence for skill of positive and negative PNA phases. More specifically, we divided CONUS, the continental US, into five subregions in order to determine the skill and effects of different teleconnections in different regions of the US. So we had a West Coast region, a Mountain West region, a Great Plains region, and then divided the East Coast into a Northeast and Southeast region. So just to get us acquainted with what these types of figures will show, uh, what we're gonna do now is compare the three different models that Melanie and Sam just described, uh, subsetted across all five of the subdomains across the CONUS, as well as the CONUS overall, uh, looking at this anomaly correlation coefficient. Uh, so first here, we're gonna look at the winter time. Uh, what we can see overall is that by and large, uh, the ECMWF is outperforming the other two models, uh, but with CESM shortly behind that. So we thought that was interesting and you know, kind of good that the in-house model uh, fared so well, at least in this metric. 
Uh, one additional thing, especially in the Southeast, um, is that we notice that there's slightly higher scale at this week five and six lead time with a slightly higher anomaly correlation coefficient compared to some of the other regions like the Mountain West and the West Coast. Um, if we go forward now and look at the summertime, we can see a pretty similar pattern shows up. We have the ECMWF doing the best. We have CESM somewhere in the middle with NSEP more or less uh, performing the worst of the three models. Um, but again, we see this pop out, especially with the ECMWF of the Eastern region in JJA having higher ACC um, and a little bit more forecast skill at that weeks five and six lead time compared to some of the other regions. So that uh, further motivated us to look at some of the uh, spatial patterns of what uh, anomaly correlation coefficient could look like. So here we're looking at the state dependence of the uh, ACC skill within the three models uh, associated with uh, the PNA pattern. And essentially, you'll one look at, sorry, you'll observe right away that there is a lot of uh, regional variation um, associated with the skill. Um, and that, uh, next slide, please. And that you'll see that the PNA is actually associated with increased skill for the lead time 15, which is weeks three to four, and lead time 31 days, which is uh, weeks five to six. Um, so another observation for the state dependence is that one, red shows the increase in ACC, therefore PNA um, is associated with increased skill in those red regions, while it's associated with re reduced skill in the blue regions. Um, you'll notice that um, ECMWF and CSM2 and also NCEP shows that that sort of uh, temperature gradient bi bimodal pattern over the over CONUS uh, that is associated with the PNA um, and that for lead 15, there's also increased skill associated particularly with the Western and uh, Central US temperatures. Um, while in lead 31 days, you'll see that there's more increased skill over the Eastern coast for all three models. Next slide, please. But when we do, when we look at the negative PNA, um, you also see that there is, I think, um, more variation in terms of uh, the intermodel comparison. Uh, for one, CSM2 stands out a lot in that you get increased skill over the entire US, uh, US continent, uh, which might explain a little bit of why you see CSM2 sort of, out, sort of uh, um, uh, outstripping ECMWF and NCEP at at longer lead times. Um, but for both the positive PNA and the negative PNA, you'll see that uh, there is very little change, I think, in terms of um, ACC that is associated with uh, lead one or weeks one to two. So the main takeaway from this state dependence part is that one, the PNA is associated with um, subregional variations in skill um, and that it has um, more skill at longer lead times, weeks three to four and weeks five to six. So concluding all the things that we've done so far for this ASP colloquium, we find that the ECMWF model has the highest prediction skill at the same time looking at the corners. East Coast has the highest prediction skill when we take the two meter temperature and we also see that East Coast has more prediction skill when we initialize forecast in both like positive and negative Pacific North American pattern. And each model here shows that there is slightly different signals when we take into consideration different positive and negative uh, PNA pattern. So also in future, we also wanna do the significance testing of the results that we've shown so far because we haven't done that yet. And we also wanna <clears throat> analyze seasonality of state dependent verification and want to use other metrics else than ACC to get better picture of season dependency of models we've used. And we also want to scrutinize the role of MGO phases on state dependent verification as we want to explore more the sources of S2S prediction for CONUS reason and also 
we want to apply similar analysis that we've done so far with using other parameters like geopotential height and precipitation to get better and comprehensive understanding on prediction skills of different models that we've used. So with that, we're ready to take any questions, concerns, feedbacks. Thank you. Great. Thanks all your very impressive work again in such a, such a short time. So thanks for a great presentation. So now we have about 10 minutes for questions and discussion for both the groups that presented now. And if there are questions for the previous groups as well, feel free to post them. I see one question from Zane uh, to the machine learning group. Zane, would you like to unmute and ask? Sure. Um, I really liked that talk, Will. And, um, I thought some of the LRP results in particular were cool. I wondered if you guys, especially based on the LRP maps, looked at if you remove the MJO and just use ENSO because it looked like you know that, that was a big source of skill or did you look at just the MJO to try to get at you know, which one of those two pieces is is really giving you more skill? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, <laughs> short answer is no. Uh, it's uh, it's on the the long list of things that we want to do. Um, my intuition would say that it was all, all the skill was coming from Enzo, but then we saw some of those figures where we were in an Enzo neutral state, and MJO, you know, in a particular phase, was giving us a lot of skill. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of testing that that there needs to needs to be done in that realm. So uh yeah we're looking forward to doing that thanks zane thanks will other questions on i had one for the climpred group um when you looked at the pna plus and minus and its relationship to the two meter temperature so yeah, will has done uh, some recent work on and so forcing of pna itself and like there being an internal variability part of the PNA versus a forced component of the PNA. Right? So have you considered um, when you do the state dependent prediction skill, doing some kind of a regression or like how much of it is coming from ENSO forcing PNA then leading to skill in two meter temperature versus if you just have uh, PNA alone. So you, you might have to do like regression and remove the ENSO signal from it or some other method, right? Yeah, I know in our uh, methodology, at the very least for the neutral states, we tried to make sure that they did not fall in either PNA or NAO. Um, so that could easily be applied to other tele teleconnections to get neutral states of additional, um, additional fields, just so that we know that there isn't that interconnection. Yeah, and we're also aware as well that there are um, relationships between all of these different, they're not isolated <laughs> at all, <laughs> um, PNA, NAO, MJO, and so, yeah, and we we noticed this also because uh, we didn't just do the PNO, PNA, sorry, um, we did look at um, patterns for the NAO and MJO, but uh, just focused more on, on one, on the PNA. But yeah, yeah, that's a good observation. Great, thanks. I also would like to, muted, yeah. <laughs> I would also to point out that one of our students, Naomi Jordan, um, defended her PhD thesis. So congratulations. <laughs> Jordan, yep. <laughs> Doctor. Thanks everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, yeah, in terms of future work, have all of you discussed about um, yeah, AGU presentations or AMS presentations? And I know we'll have a longer discussion this afternoon. Um, but are you? planning to put in an abstract for these conferences for presenting? We are at the Hydra group. Okay, great. I guess the others are still discussing. We're I think we're going to Austin. Okay, great. Mm -hmm.